My name's James Broadbent, and I'm giving this talk on behalf of the Friends of Fernhill and Mulgoa Valley. Uh, I'm an architectural and cultural historian and have lived in the valley for oh, 40 or 50 years now. This part of the Mulgoa Valley was first granted to Edril Luttrell and his family. Luttrell had arrived in New South Wales as a free settler with his wife and eight children in 1804 and was appointed assistant surgeon in the colony. The acting governor after Governor Bly's deposition, William Patterson, granted each of Luttrell's children 125 acres along the Mulgoa Creek, grants which were confirmed in 1810 by the new governor, Lachlan Macquarie. Luttrell was incompetent as a surgeon, was dishonest and dismissed. With a large family to support, he fell into poverty. Macquarie allowed them government rations. The Luttrells do not appear to have developed their grants along Mulgoa Creek in any way, and in 1816 sold them to William Cox, the road builder. Luttrell departed for Van Diemen's Land, where he was equally unsuccessful. In 1817, William Cox conveyed the Luttrell grants to his son George, who in 1823 sold them on to his brother Henry. Henry already owned 563 acres at Mulgoa, known as Mount Henry, adjacent to his father's and brother's lands further along the valley. Also in 1823, William Cox conveyed an 850-acre grant to Henry prior to his marriage, and George sold him a further 640 acres that he had acquired from Thomas Hobby in 1815. By 1825, Henry Cox owned a large estate that encompassed the fertile and well-watered land between Mulgoa Creek and the Nepean River. 1,300 acres were cleared and 110 acres were cultivated. The majority of his stock were sheep. In 1826, Henry was indebted to the government for about 800 bushels of wheat payment for the clearing of his land by parties of government convicts. Henry also acquired land across the mountains in an area that would later become known as Mudgee. By 1828, Henry Cox owned a total of 7,208 acres in the colony. Following his marriage in 1823 to Francis Mackenzie, he lived at the Cox's first house at Mulgoa, the cottage but soon began building his own house at Glenmore, on the portion of land that had been granted to Edward Luttrell's ne'er-do-well son, Robert. This house appears to have been completed by 1825, when the French traveller, Baron Hyacinthe de Bougainville, visited and described it. That is the core of the house we see today, a substantial verandered bungalow possibly with attic rooms and a wing to the west. Little is known of the Cox's life at Glenmore in the prosperous 1830s. In the 1840s, Henry took out two mortgages to tide him over the severe economic depression and in the late part of that decade, moved most of his livestock to his mudgy properties. In 1852, Henry Cox sold Glenmore to his half-brother Alfred and moved permanently to Mudgee. Alfred Cox retained the property for only a little over a year. In July 1853, the estate was purchased for £3,000 by Thomas Sutcliffe Mort. The sale in included all the former lateral grants, the 850-acre grant acquired from William Cox, an additional 443 acres in Mulgoa and two further smaller parcels of land. Thomas Sutcliffe Mort was a man of considerable and varied business interests. He was a greatly successful auctioneer. He engaged in pastoralism, engineering, mining and dairying. But it was his revolutionary contribution to the frozen meat industry which he is, from which he is most remembered. He purchased Glenmore, presumably as a country house, 
but on her first visit with her children, Mrs. Mort, it is said, was stranded by floodwaters and took a dislike to the place. Whether this story is true or not, or whether Mort really purchased Glenmore as a speculation is unknown. He only held the place for a year before selling it in August 1854 for 5,000 pounds to John James Riley, making a substantial profit of 2,000 pounds in a year on a property in which he is unlikely to have made any improvements. J.J. Riley came from an influential merchant family established in Sydney and in India in the Macquarie period, with considerable property in the town and country. Riley, established at Glenmore, rose to local prominence and influence. In 1860, when volunteer corps were established, Riley became the captain of the Penrith Company. And in 1871, when the municipality of Penrith was proclaimed, J.J. Riley became Penrith's first mayor, a position he held for four years. At Glenmore, he developed the house, the garden, and the estate. In the 1860s, Riley enlarged the house, added the eastern wing, and generally brought it up to date with fashionable details. The gable ends of the wings with decorative barge boards were embellished with the Riley crest and the veranda rebuilt with elegant, rather gothic posts. Shuttered French doors led onto the veranda and the terraces and novel techniques and materials were employed, most notably newly introduced corrugated iron Remarkably, much of this early iron of a bolder profile than a modern iron survives on the verandas and on the wings. Glenmore gained a reputation for its style and upkeep. In 1871, a newspaper correspondent wrote, We rode between the beautiful paddocks of Mr. J.J. Riley, where the stock look in fine condition, as how could they help being in the midst of such splendid feed? And the neatly kept homestead with gardens sloping down to the creek shows unmistakable evidence of good taste in the proprietor. Riley enlarged the, and enhanced the garden, and it is to him that we must be indebted for the planting of the aricarias and the cowrie pine, which are now such impressive features of the landscape. In 1890, a former governess, Kathleen Lambert, recalled her time at Glenmore in the 1860s, its garden and its surroundings. We drove between hawthorn hedges and arched entrances to orchard, vineyard and orangery. The front of the house was literally a carpet of flowers as the gravelled sweep was covered with many-coloured portulacas and marguerite which were allowed to grow and blossom during the master and mistress's absence. In the foreground, a large bed with trees and flowering shrubs bordered by verbenas and petunias of every hue. Beyond a croquet lawn, paddocks enclosed for kangaroo and deer, then grassy slopes bounded by distant hills clothed from base to summit with foliage. The house was somewhat of the Italian style, commodious with large, lofty rooms, double halls and cool passages. A long veranda covered with climbing plants on one side, into which my room opened, and immediately in front of my window, the opening into the flower garden, which was always full of blossom. The finest oak tree I had seen for many a day was here, surrounded by a low hedge of laurestines. Beyond was the orangery with the rich green leafy trees, the snowy buds and the blossoms perfuming the air. Our household at Glenmore was a very happy one. Mrs. James, one of the sweetest tempered women I have ever met, ruled her large family by love and gentleness. There were eight children from one to 20 at home. James Riley died in 1882, 
and the estate passed to his widow and four surviving daughters. Ladies, whom it was said, followed in their mother's footsteps, given to good works, and no public movement in the district which had for its object the benefit of the poor, sick, or the needy, was complete if a Miss Riley was not in it. In 1891, the Glenmore estate was offered for sale or lease, possibly owing to the Depression, but failed to sell. And in 1904, presumably owing to the Mrs. Riley's straitened circumstances, the Glenmore became a select school for young ladies. In about 1920, Glenmore was finally sold to Donald Hattersley and Charles Holdsworth, Holdswich, both graziers of Penrith, for £9,750. Hattersley subsequently bought out Holdswich's share and began to sell off portions of the estate. In September and October 1926, Hattersley put up for auction his complete dairy herd, his dairy plant and household furniture. It must have been at this auction that my own father remembered the pantry in the house, full of jars and jars of preserves and jams left from the Mrs. Riley's day. By 1929, Glenmore had been reduced to its current boundaries and its new role as a golf course had begun. After the First World War, and with the increasing popularity of motor vehicles, the Mulgoa Valley role as a tourist attraction began. In 1926, the Nepean Times reported that a Sydney syndicate, in conjunction with the Mayor of Penrith, Alderman J.J. Price, secured an option over Glenmore, consisting of 177 acres for the purpose of establishing a country club with a nominal capital of £15,000. Already prominent city men have inspected the place and golfing experts have pronounced it ideal for the purpose of putting down a championship course. It is intended to provide tennis courts and a bowling green. But Glenmore was not formally sold to Glenmore Country Club Limited until 1937. It remained in that ownership until it sold in 1947 to Irene Woodland of Penrith. A succession of leases followed until its next sale in 1981. Sadly, about this time, much of James Riley's decorative detailing of the house, its finely joined French doors and its shutters were destroyed. But Glenmore is still easily recognisable as the house that Henry and Francis Cox built nearly 200 years ago, and James Riley's fashionably remodelled modelled a century and a half ago. It remains an essential part of the aesthetic, cultural and historic landscape of the Mulgoa Valley.